we have plenty of stuff today. Unfortunately, I happened to Jose. <laughs> I run out of time. I thought I would be much quicker, or at least I would cover uh, things that some of you might know, so that I didn't have to go over there with a little bit more detail than I have. So I will discuss today two things in the two uh, parts of this lecture. The first one is preheating, the second one will be primary battle. Let's see how far can I get through preheating. Uh, you have my notes, so you could go through them. The details of how particles are produced at the end of inflation are there's clearly detail there. I'll explain. So I will give you here a, an overview. Okay, so preheating it's a phenomenon which we think occurs right at the end of inflation when uh, the stage of inflation ends. Okay, we have there the conversion of energy from inflation to the radiation and matter eras. Immediately after inflation, which is this uh, stage in which the energy density is approximately constant, we enter into radiation and then into matter and possibly today uh, into some approximately constant, uh, again, energy density. So, so we'll enter some kind of sphere uh, universe. And in the meantime, there's a lot of phenomena. Okay? Between this gratified scale, if the bridge is that high, and the present scale of the universe, we have from varying acoustic uh, sorry, uh, a symmetry of the universe, they generate varying symmetry, generate at some uh, scale, at the scale. The GCD we could have just before the production of primordial black holes, immediately after big back photosynthesis, at scales corresponding to interactions of electromagnetism, we have the CMB. Soon after the uh, epoch of realization, where the universe becomes transparent, and there is time then for structure to form, uh, stars, galaxies, and so on, to create the structure we observed, where gravity is the main force. Okay, so we're going through a series of scales in energy and in size, which are extraordinary. We're covering like 40 orders of magnitude, both in scales, in energy, and in space. It's extraordinary that we could have an overall picture which is consistent of cosmology from that early epoch to today. I myself am quite impressed with what has been achieved in the last 40 years in cosmology. Okay? Things are thought to be completely unrelated. So how did the power spectrum of uh, the magnetic distribution of galaxies in the universe have to do with early universe physics was completely unheard of and unexpected. Okay? Yes, is yeah. that a question, Jose? Yeah, the reason temperature can be as low as BBM. Excuse me. What do you say? The temperature of free heating? Yes. As well as BBM state. We don't have any evidence except for the requirement that you have to produce somehow the parallel symmetry of the universe yeah. to ask whether the universe was or not at some temperature above the um, production of, okay. of, sorry, of, of nuclei. Okay. 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 So certainly at 1 MeV, we don't have any negative to be sure uh, would produce this barrier symmetry. So perhaps we do need to reach electroweak scale. That doesn't mean that it has to be reached uh, when the universe was thermal. I'm not asking for thermalization at the scale of the electroweak scale. Uh, we know that the transition, uh, according to the degrees of freedom that we can measure in the standard model, was not a first order phase transition. Okay? It was at most crossover. The crossover means that you don't have uh, properties which may help the production of barriers, but there are ways, and I will describe today, within preheating to produce the barrier symmetry of the universe in a cold universe without being uh, fertilized. But the physics required for the asymmetry of the universe was simply not in place at the time of the impact of the So you need some new physics, we we'll describe it as phalanons, as the violation, to be able to construct the barrier symmetry. But let me go through this. I will not describe Otherwise, I won't have that much time. Right, so these are the different phenomena. Supernovae being observed, giving you instances 
on a, the epoch of Trojan contamination. The distribution of matter, galaxies mostly, will give you information about how the structure formed. In the future, the epoch of relaxation with SKA, how did all those little places where uh, structures started to form, stars, galaxies, and, and clusters started begun their life, initiated the uh, relaxation of the universe. Nowadays, the universe is totally reionized. It is still transparent to uh, photons, visible photons, but higher energy photons are immediately uh, capping off the CMB and, and all the charges and other completely absorbed. Now, there is also our information that we can get from the CMB. It will tell us about how those little dots in this image are related to fundamental physics in, in the universe and to the formation of structure much later on. So we have a picture where we can correlate, and this is the key thing, different scales and different instances in the uh, evolution of the universe are not completely isolated. They are strongly correlated because of fundamental physics behind it. We don't know what is the physics beyond that of uh, nuclear physics responsible for the origin of the barrier that later on would form the, the first nuclei. We can follow, however, very nicely through the uh, nuclear interaction uh, cross-sections that we can measure in the lab, what are the rates at which those light elements would be produced and they are exactly, uh, their abundance today is exactly what is predicted by the expansion of the universe and therefore we know that at least in this epoch the universe was behaving as we thought uh, within the hot big bang theory. Okay? The universe was dominated by radiation, we know the rates of expansion of the universe, the number of degrees of freedom that were counting for uh, the expansion, and we know the fundamental physics, nuclear interaction physics responsible, so we know that indeed something like this must have happened in the universe. Beyond this, as Hosko was pointing out, we don't really have direct evidence, we have indirect evidence. Okay? In particular, it might be that there are new phenomena, the formation of primordial black holes, which today can be seen through the inspiraling of those black holes, which emit gravitational waves, which recently have been detected. So we've opened up a new era where gravitational wave astronomy will, together with optical, radio, micro, etc., astro astronomy will help us constrain fundamental physics. We'll see how the production of primordial black holes, time just before the QCD transition, may be today a fundamental issue, for instance, on the uh, nature of dark matter and the formation of structure. So we are going to connect now things that were absolutely disconnected a few years ago. Okay? And this is for the future, just like uh, the epoch of realization is. This is what we are going to explore in the next few days. Of course, I was saying that in order to uh, produce a baryon, sorry, the nuclei that we observe, we need uh, some baryon symmetry. We have to have more baryons than antibaryons. Sorry, what happened? Baryon symmetry of the universe? Okay, I didn't mention it. Didn't here. So we have, we need some, at this scale, at the electric scale, some mechanism that will be responsible for this symmetry. And I will describe within this lecture how, in the epoch of reheating, if inflation indeed gave rise to all of this extremely rich phenomenology, perhaps at this epoch we have the right conditions right, in order to produce the barrenness and the So we'll go through that. So, let me very briefly describe the outline of the spread reheating of the inflation, the thermalization, and the origin of the hot Big Bang. So the Big Bang, the modern Big Bang, is the moment in which the extraordinarily large energy density driving the expansion of the universe during inflation gets converted into radiation and matter. That's the primal egg that uh, Lemaitre was talking about in the beginning of the 20th century. We know now that it's much more complicated than we thought, and not just simply a scattering of particles which eventually reach thermalization. It is possible that at the end of inflation, very rich phenomenology comes due to a new process called preheating. It's not new in time. We discussed 
the first uh, discussions were 15 years ago, but this phenomenon before the thermalization of the universe might produce a very rich instance, a very rich phenomenon. Now, one of those that I will concentrate on is the uh, barogenesis and or leptogenesis that will allow us through reheating to generate the barrier symmetry of the universe. I'll go dwell a little bit into it. And possibly a, a way to know, for instance, if we produce baryons right at the end of inflation through preheating, we might still not be able, because the only point that reaches us is this asymmetry, how much, how many baryons over antibaryons were produced at the time. And that's a quantity that we can also measure from a big band photosynthesis, but we may not have some other clues on what was the exact process that took place that precisely produced this asymmetry except for things that could travel since then completely untouched. And what are those gravitational waves? Any other photon would have scattered since the production of the barrier symmetry until today without leaving any trace. We don't have any instance of a very strong phase transition giving rise to a barrier symmetry that we can claim connects one thing to the other. So gravitational waves, if they are produced right at the same instant as the barium symmetry, will have signatures that we should be able eventually to measure. Of course, these gravitational waves have a very small amplitude. They have not been detected yet. It's a stochastic background, just like the CMB background. And if we ever measure it, it's in the high frequency domain, if we ever measure it, it will give us a snapshot of what was the universe like at the time of the Big Bang. Okay? This is just like the CMB being a snapshot of what was the time at which atoms form and has extremely rich details that help us understand the fundamental description of cosmology. In the case of the gravitational wave background from preheating, this again will be a tremendously powerful tool to know what's, what's going on right at the end of inflation. So it will tell us, in, in the picture that I had at the beginning, the connection between the epoch of, say, n equals zero, uh, eta right at the end of inflation to today. You would make a connection to testing information on what was the, the physics occurring right at the end of inflation at the moment, what we call the Big Bang. Okay, now reheating is a very complicated dynamic. It's no, no wonder it's not yet in the textbooks. There are very non perturbative effects, very non-linear interactions. We're very far from equilibrium. Back reaction on the metric is important. They have to take into account. Rescatterings, that is, particle physics and gravity, yeah, are important. It occurs simultaneously in the expanding universe. It's not just physics that we can ignore in, at the time. Metric fluctuations, essentially back reaction, metric fluctuations, are relevant. So we cannot ignore those. All the different fields are involved together. Okay? And in some cases, when we produce magnetic fields, we we'll see that it's very difficult to connect the production of those fields with the full magnetohydrodynamic simulations, which would then allow us to extrapolate from that instant where barriers, magnetic fields, possibly black holes, etc., were produced all the way until today. So we are talking about phenomena that are very rich, occur in an essentially an instant, and have tremendous consequences for the uh, posterior evolution of the universe and still have very few clues that we can extract. Was there a constraint in the duration of the heat? Why is it what? What is the constraint on the duration of the heat? Okay, uh, we have not many constraints on it. Uh, we, for instance, the number of EFOs, if we knew exactly the number of EFOs, we could tell for instance, by having sufficient number of EFOs evolving during a, a large range of scales, CMB, Russian structure, Lyman alpha, etc., we would be able to tell what was the scale of inflation. Imagine we measure the tensor, the scalar ratio, and from here, at a given model, we might determine the number of EFOs. Within generic process, if it's a, some flat plateau inflation. So, of course, we don't know, we're not probing, except for reheating, that last epoch. So we are allowed to make some shift, but not that much. Most models would have a, a connection between the number of EFOs and the spectral index. So 
uh, like in, in the morning we, we know what I was discussing uh, on Tuesday. So, how many EFOs is directly related to the reheated temperature because that determines the curvature scale today. Okay, if you have 65 EFOs and this determines the tilt, we know that necessarily there, it must have been uh, high reheating. Now that high reheating, if we know that a model, we know when inflation ended, the whole conversion of energy into a radiation and matter at that instant will give you also how many EFOs it took, the reheating, whether it was a very efficient reheating, all the energy density got converted into radiation and matter, and then the radiation epoch started, and we know how long it, it, it lasted. All those things, I could write down the, the expression of the number of EFOs in units of the reheating temperature and the uh, interval of, or the efficiency, if you want, of reheating. And even though it is a logarithmic dependence, there is some. It's not completely free. For instance, if we, um, if we end up convincing ourselves that inflation did not occur at very high scales, so that we need the, the temperature scale ratio to be measured, then it might happen that the number of EFOs is much more than 20 if inflation occurs at the electronic scale. Otherwise, uh, you have a much tighter connection between uh, reheating temperature and the extent of which reheating occurs. Now, preheating is going to occur in essentially in this time compared to the evolution of preheating. Okay. Preheating is the initial stages right at the end of inflation where this non particulate phenomena that I'm describing here occur. Okay? This is much before the thermalization of the universe. Mm -hmm. So this might take a few uh, oscillations of the inflator, maybe not even one e-fold compared to the 60. And soon after, the expansion of the universe eventually would thermalize those particles that are produced at preheating and enter into the radiation domain. So how much extent do we have here? from preheating to the final thermalization, still in question, but affects both the posterior evolution and the number of people. So if we could connect those two, then we're done. We would know how efficient preheating was. So it is so, uh, this is why I'm saying uh, we have very little handle on what was, the f what was occurring here, except if we manage to measure the radiation with background. From, from the because then it will tell you from the amplitude and the features in the gravitational background what are the properties that occur during the heat. Okay, have state? No. Again, it's low the, uh... Yeah, very little. Except, I insist again, the gravitational wave background. Okay? Right. Well, you've noticed, I, I was very much insisting on this uh, in the second lecture that. Inflation, it's a paradigm, it's an idea. We still do not have fundamental dynamics associated with inflation. The different models that we have come up with are so different in, in, in ranges of scales, of amplitudes of tensor to scalar, of tilts. It has tremendously varied dynamics, okay? which means that we don't really know what is the field of inflation. We don't know how this field couples to other fields. The only thing we know that it's energy density is dominating during some period of the expansion of the universe. So there are unknown couplings and masses in general. Of course, there will be cases where we know much more about it. We don't know the energy scale of inflation. This goes uh, with Hoss's question. We don't know actually the rate of expansion <coughs> or the equation of state, essentially the same question at that time. The initial conditions uh, are also rather unknown because we only probe through the CMB electrical structure the very large scales. We're not probing the last few efforts of inflation. Therefore, we don't know whether the initial conditions, whether the scalar field has already settled to a, a plateau or it's very widely oscillating around minimum. Okay, those properties will affect the conditions that will determine preheating after inflation. There are many unknowns, except in very special cases. Okay? MSSN inflation idea that we, we put out in 96, which, no, sorry, 2006, where uh, possibly some uh, flat directions uh, that was protected by supersymmetry might give rise to the right amount of 
uh, the right to political freedom, which you would then couple through the full uh, part of the branch and to the rest of, of matter. But, uh, hate, sorry, the, the HST has not uh, found any supersymmetric particle, and this required that uh, some of those particles <coughs> should have been seen, and they have not been seen. Possible. Is it possible to write an effective theory for the hidden? No, I don't think it is. So the way we should discuss this. Uh, the, use of uh, the problem is that it's, it's extremely uh, varied. You could go case by case. For instance, a parametric resonance and tachyonic preheating is completely different. I will go through those today. So the, there's no, you, you cannot have an effective description for which would be universal. They're very different. But let, let me go. Uh, I can answer this at the end of this uh, first mm -hmm. session. Okay? But let me uh, be a little bit more specific about the heat inflation. Heat inflation, uh, one of the models that we were discussing yesterday, heat inflation, the Higgs is acting as the infrared one. But then, of course, if this is the Higgs of the standard model, the only difference is the non minimum coupling to gravity, psi phi dagger phi r, then we know all the couplings of the Higgs to matter. There is nothing more than the standard model, all the way to the, to the gut scale. And therefore, we know the particles. The, so all these unknowns are known. So we can at least address what is the rate at which uh, reheating occurs. And we did this with uh, Javier Rubio and, and Daniel Rafael Figueroa. And we found that reheating in Higgs inflation was extremely efficient. It was very fast. So it occurred very soon. The degrees of freedom that were produced with those of the Higgs coupled to the rest of matter, and uh, it entered into the radiation straight away. There were no other degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So at least we know that there are cases where one can go all the way through the whole project yeah? from inflation down to all the scale that I was describing in the previous perspectives. Okay. Now, in reheating, there's uh, quite a vast majority of a variety of uh, processes uh, along the process question, which makes it very difficult to make an effective description because you could have parametric resonance like in chaotic inflation, tachyonic uh, instabilities like in hydro inflation, you could have even instant preheating, strong coupling. So one the infraton oscillating and decaying in just one oscillation if it's very strongly coupled to in particles. You could have fermionic preheating, not just producing a high collision numbers of, of both but also producing, even though you have power rocking, fermions, higher division numbers. So, in, in high momentum space. Even no oscillation preheating. So, a power law inflation we're discussing, which was exponentially decaying, you could still produce reheating in those cases. Okay. Modulated preheating. Let me, please, otherwise I won't finish. <laughs> <laughs> In modulated preheating, you could even produce as a curvature modes by having reheating occur in different places in, of the universe at different rates. And this would introduce uh, some interesting modulation, you know, which would generate as a curvature mode. Or you could have something that we call combined preheating, which uh, is, is related to Higgs inflation, where not only do you produce bosons, you produce also gauge fields, which themselves decay into fermions. And the parametric resonance production of gauge bosons has to be combined, therefore the name, uh, combined preheating, with the perturbative decay of the tumors. So it's a, it's a complicated, very rich phenomenon where both perturbative and non perturbative decays play a role. It has extremely rich phenomenology. So you could have non thermal production of particles, for instance, we have seen it, you could produce very heavy particles. There are a few numbers which possibly today would dominate the universe, but non thermal. You produce strings. The string people were extremely happy about this result because they thought that since strings could not produce structure, because having just a bump in the power spectrum was uh, against their predictions, they realized well, if inflation has occurred, any topological defect that we would have, would have had before would have been completely washed out. Except if you have a phase transition after inflation or you produce those homological defects right at the end of inflation. For instance, the model which has like hyper inflation, which has some non-trivial homotopy group, right at the end of inflation, this produces defects, which means strains. 
You could have also electrical invariances and high-energy electrogenesis. You could have production of gravitational waves over the spray, magnetic fields, black holes, and possibly generation of non-Gaussianities. So we were discussing, I think it was the first lecture, what would be the sources of non-Gaussianities. We're discussing different fields, different couplings, non-minimal couplings, and so on. Here we have another instance where non-Gaussianities can be produced right at the end of the fission. Okay? For instance, modulated preheating. Produces non Okay, so how is it all going on? So we have right at the end of inflation, this scalar field rolling and starting to oscillate. And like any other particle which had couples to uh, further fields, this object, as it oscillates, will generate particles. At the simple acceleration, what it will generate the uh, production of other particles to which it couples, an electric charge oscillating. Phenomenon which produces photons, which themselves produce other fields. So, the simple oscillation at the end of the potential with vacuum energy goes to zero produces tremendous production of new particles. It could occur in a perturbative way using the uh, whole uh, formalism of quantum field theory, okay, perturbative the case, or in a very non perturbative way, as I will describe, through preheating. So let's go first to the perturbative decay of the particle. How does it work? Well, remember that at the end of inflation, imagine it's simple, uh, the potential could be as complicated as, as you may, but at the end of inflation, you could linearize your, your potential around the minimum, and this would be like an ordinary m squared phi squared. And therefore, right at the end of inflation, in this potential, you can just write around this minimum your curvature, curvature will give you a mass, and your field, which is expanding, due to this term, you have some friction, will behave like a neutral harmonic oscillator, whose solution is a sinusoidal wave. Now, the expansion of the universe will make this amplitude decrease. But we can compute, very simply, from this homogeneous field, what is the mean density, the mean pressure. The mean density is proportional to the sum of phi n squared, phi dot squared, phi dot squared gives you cos squared, phi squared gives you sine squared, the sum of these two is one, so you get nothing but the energy density given by the amplitude of the field, which decays very slowly compared to the oscillations of the field. In the case of the expectation of the pressure, you have the difference between these two terms rather than the sum. Now, since it is statistically, you don't distinguish the phi squared term from the phi dot squared, those two things happen. So a homogeneous field we know behaves like a pressureless field, which we've known for decades. Okay? So it behaves like matter. Energy density of the field decays like one over the scale factor cube. The number density, M phi. So if this is matter, you can write rho m squared phi squared as m times the number density, so m times uh, phi squared is this number density, which also decays like 1 over the cube, naturally. The number of computation numbers of, of the infinite are simply of that neutral way with the expansion. And this tells you that the amplitude phi decreases like 1 over t. So this is the key. Very simple. Okay? Right, but this, if the field couples to other fields, it's clear that this background field, which is homogeneous, okay, which is given inertia to particles to which it couples, okay, it's going to act on the quantum fields to which it couples as a time-dependent mass. Okay? Imagine a Lagrangian, which would be similar to that of the standard model, where you have your inflaton field, you have some other scalar field, it could be gauge field. Okay? I'm treating just the scalar component of it. We could have the fermion coupling to the Higgs, or oh, sorry, to the inflaton. You could have this uh, couplings of this uh, chi field to the inflaton, and possibly even the K channels. So, in general, the value, the expression, the effective description of the scalar field under the perturbative decay of the phi field due to this couplings can be written this way. And this is really a hand-waving uh, argument, because effectively what happens is that your inflaton 
is made out of many particles. Each one of those couples to other particles. So they have a probability of decay. If you want, since this is also a quantum field, it will have a propagator. And it's, when it's <coughs> propagated, it will have a energy yeah. operator, pi, which will tell you what is the probability of decay. It's related through the optical theorem to the uh, decay rate. The inverse, sorry, the imaginary part of this uh, energy operator will be nothing but the mass times the, the, the decay rate. So, for the propagator, written it up as an equation for the expectation value of the field phi means that your energy density from this field is going to be drained not only because of the expansion of the universe, but it's going to be drained because of the decay of individual particles from the center atom into the part to which it comes. So effectively, you can write it as a friction term. Okay? So you're losing energy. So this drain is of energy. This can be, in, in, insist, phenomenology, or effectively write it as a friction term. And you can integrate this equation out explicitly. So it tells you that the amplitude not only decreases with the expansion of the universe, like 1 over t, and oscillates like sinusoidally with the mass, but also decays with the decay rate of the signal, which includes all the possible particle physics decay rates. So the energy density of the inflows on it's decaying with the rate going down. So how do we compute this in quantum field theory? Well, we do the usual quantum field theory. We assume these fields are in the vacuum. This one is on shell. We decay, we couple it through the Lagrangian terms that we had here, this one and this one, both for fermions and for scalars, in general bosons. Okay, it doesn't really matter, it's going to be you. The term finds those fields. And we can compute the total decay. It will be the sum of all possible bosonic degrees of freedom plus the sum of all possible fermionic degrees of freedom. For bosonic, they are proportional to the coupling of this field square v all that square, and that square over the mass of the of the inflaton. And for the fermions, it's very simply just the, the square of the Yukawa coupling. Right, so we can sum all this up and re rewrite them as an effective coupling to the rest of the matter of gauge, sorry, uh, scalars and gauge and fermions, three color coupling. And the thing that we need is that this quantity be smaller. Why do I ask for this? Well, well I didn't write it there. I ask for this because there will be Gradient corrections. If you have a decay of the inflaton into psi by psi, you can always make your diagram, close your diagram, and compute the mass term. Or you can compute the lambda term corresponding to four phi interactions. <coughs> so effectively, you're running in the loop many fields, which are those to which the inflaton couples. And therefore, you're renormalizing your effective potential. Remember that the potential for the inflaton has to be sufficiently flat that you have this lower order condition satisfied. So this would be your potential far away from the minimum, where we are right at the end of inflation. But this same coupling would exist at any scale. Okay. Among others, it would be all us on very large scales. But we know from CAB anisotropies that those couplings should, could not be very large. Otherwise, it would have prevented this lower order. So it will require lambda, which gets corrected due to those terms, to be smaller than about 10 times 12 or so. And therefore, since the effective coupling is going to act on, on lambda in a way which goes h effective to the power, let's see, where did I get 10 to minus 4? Yeah, there's a factor, so this is h effective 
is the mass column of Viper, one loop contribution goes to the sum of the masses of those particles over 64 pi squared log scale. The mass to the fourth, this is where the power four comes in, is going to be corrected. This is going to change your lambda term. And this, these masses are essentially h effective to the fourth. And therefore, we know that this quantity cannot be larger than 10 to the minus 12, which means that h effective would not be much larger than 10 to the minus 4. Otherwise, our effective potential would have been modified and introduced an amplitude which is much larger than it's allowed by observations. So this is a way and way by which we know that the couplings better be small, unless you have some symmetry, as we would have in the case of Higgs inflation. Okay, so if those couplings are small, we can compute how quickly with the universe reheat under perturbative decay. So when will a reheating will occur? Well, those particles, when they are produced, they are completely uh, decoupled. They will have interactions. Those interactions will not be faster than the rate of expansion. The inflaton will, uh, we are accustomed to uh, computing decay rates of particles in a universe which has lasted 10 to the 17 seconds. But those decay rates for such a large values of the masses, remember because H effective times the mass of the inflaton, if the mass of the inflaton is 10 to the 13 GB, and those effective couplings are so small, the decay rates are going to be of your 10 to the minus 25 seconds. Now, 10 to the minus 25 seconds might seem to be extremely fast today. But remember, the age of the universe at the end of inflation was 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So 10 to the minus 25 did not yet occur. One has to wait until the universe becomes old enough until the decay rate of the inflaton could actually allow the inflaton to decay. So this is rather unusual. We are accustomed to extremely fast decay rates to occur in the universe, which, as I said, lasts for years. At least we can do experiments in the lab, which lasts for years. Well, here, the universe was not old enough for the inflaton to decay. So it kept on oscillating until the clock catch up with its decay rate. The moment that happened, and this is what happens here, the moment the decay rate uh, <coughs> is of order the age of the universe, because the lifetime is bigger than the age of the universe, in that moment you can have decay. Before, it was simply too early. The e to the minus gamma t was essentially one. Okay? It's only after that happens, the gamma inverse is of the order or larger than the age of the universe, that the decay could happen and the energy density from the inflaton would be drained into the particle that it produces. So this is the moment eh, where we say reading might start. Because at that time the particles that are produced will themselves have sufficiently rapid interactions to thermalize themselves with the others. Before, they simply, the universe expansion was way too fast for them to encounter each other. Okay? Their interaction uh, cross-section was way too slow compared to the tremendous rate of expansion. That's because the rate of expansion at that time was humongous. It's huge. Right, so the moment the uh, decay catches up with the age of the universe, lifetime touches with the age of the universe, in that moment the energy density can be computed. Okay? So if gamma is h, we substitute here the energy density, 3h squared m plus square over a pi, and this should be equal to, given some number of degrees of freedom that you could be playing the role at that time, times the temperature to the fourth, you would have inequality here. Now if we take the number of degrees of freedom as those of the standard model, okay, we're not going to add up any more particles. We haven't seen anything beyond the standard model in the LHC. So, of course, there's no reason not to expect that, say, a grand unified uh, theory, you would have 
many more degrees of freedom. Let's say twice the number of degrees of freedom. Maybe ten times the number of degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom of the sun model is 106.75. We, we know, including the Higgs. And therefore, if we say ten times, at most 10 to the 3. So if we put here at most 10 to the 3, then we can compute the reheating temperature. And that's essentially proportional to gamma. But gamma, remember, was depending on the cross section, was proportional to h squared. Here we go. So if we substitute numbers, we get that the reheating temperature could be 10 to the 14 times this effective coupling, GV, or if h effective is less than about 1, 10 to the 13. But if h effective is less than 10 to the minus uh, 4, then we would have much lower temperatures. So the reheating temperature cannot be as large as the energy density right at the end of inflation if those couplings are very small. It's simply you have to wait until the energy is being drained out before the unit is released. Okay. If rather than having ordinary decays like we would describe it here, we have only gravitational interactions, which are much weaker, then we can compute what's the decay rate purely gravitationally, like in some of like models. It's gravitational weight suppressed, the Planck scale suppressed, and therefore the reheated temperature is much more. So here we have a big uncertainty, also was asking. We don't know whether the universe reheated at 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 GV, or way down to 10 to the 8, or even lower, perhaps, at the electro weak scale. So, so yes? This is a repeating. Is uh, the impact on the kind of matter fields through graviton loop? Through graviton loops. That's right. Well, the only thing that matters is the mass of the infraton. It's the only scale you have in the problem. Okay? And you, your packs of this. GM squared. Right. So this was the picture until around 1995, when it was realized that it's true that the inflaton is oscillating like a coherent field made of many, many particles. Each one of those particles can decay into those to which it couples. But there is a coherent phenomenon. This inflaton field is actually a Bose-Einstein condensate. It has very large occupation numbers, and it's behaving like a classical field. But this high occupation numbers means that as a condensate, it's a scalar, which is oscillating very strongly, there are coherent phenomena of this condensate which acts on the properties of its decay. And we will see that this can be extremely violent. Right, so remember, you have couplings in this g squared, phi squared, chi squared, for instance, example, discussed here, we have the field, the inflaton, which acts like a coherent wave, phi of t, modifying effectively the mass of the field chi. Okay. And we can treat this field chi, which actually only has a coupling to this background field, like quantum field theory, in background fields. What does it mean? It's a free field Hamiltonian. We could take into account self-interactions, chi to the fourth. That's not very the, one, the only term that matters for us is the time dependence of its mass. Now, a free field Hamiltonian can very immediately quantize with creation and accumulation operators. You do the usual equal time computation relations. We compute, therefore, the operators, computations. There will be equations of motion for this field, according to this Hamiltonian, which gives you a usual harmonic oscillator equation with a frequency that is time dependent. And this is crucial. This is the difference with respect to ordinary quantum field theory. Okay? It is this time dependence will, will produce the resonances. Of course, not only you have f, you have also its uh, composite conjugate, which is really the, if you want its momentum. And you can work out from this equation its Ronskia. Yeah? And here you have a phenomenon which is very similar to what we have for the production of quantum fluctuations for the inflation, which gives rise to the curvature fluctuations. And this is that a time-dependent potential. There, it was the scale factor, which was very quickly changing. Here, it is the oscillating field, which is also accelerating. Okay? So the acceleration of the inflaton right at the end of inflation, around the middle of its potential, it's producing on the particles to which it couples a time-dependent mass. And we were saying that in the sudden approximation, if those fields started in the vacuum, chi was in the vacuum, as a Gaussian 
free field. Okay? It had its own wave function. Wait, very suddenly, remember this is occurring in an accelerated way, very suddenly the mass of this field increases because phi is increasing towards its maximum. Then the field, rather than being in its ground state, will get excited. So we have high occupation numbers for the chi field, which in the next interval, when the field phi goes back again through signal before it's going up, it will find itself with high occupation numbers. Those occupation numbers will go down to the ground state and will show that that field is no longer in its ground state. It will have particles. So once you have particles and this chi field is a scalar, then if you're a boson, the rate at which you produce more bosons, it's sensitive to the occupation number that you had in the first place. Okay? There are coherent phenomena which makes a boson, a famous laser, okay, once you have some particles already in your state, this enhances right, the production of more particles, and so on. So this will occur through a series of oscillations. You produce more and more particles because you're exciting your field in a state which was already excited. This lacing phenomenon will produce, in a very short interval of time, a few oscillations, tremendous amount of particles. Perhaps this is the origin of all the entropy that we observe in the universe. So, how do we uh, work this out? Well, part of the theory of space gives us the formalism that we can use to compute the growth of the number density of modes k of the field chi, which can be worked out this way from the evolution question wrote it before, where f of k, the wave function for the field phi, satisfies now a Matthew equation. It satisfies an equation, here by the way set is empty. Okay. An equation which is time dependent, this is with respect to z, okay. with half coefficients a and q, which are famous Matthew equation coefficients, whose solutions are exponential. They are exponential times a periodic function, which is related to this. And these exponential terms will have indices, which could be a 4 or 1, okay, times this uh, set property, which show that for certain values of the momentum k, the wave number k, the oscillations are such that you systematically produce particles. And this will occur, this is similar to a sweep. If you produce particles right in phase with the oscillation, it's like when you're pushing your, your uh, swing at the right time, if you keep on pushing, even if you push very lightly right, with a finger right, on, your, on your swing, as long as you do it right in phase when it's going up, up exactly moving, then the amplitude of the swing will increase. The amplitude of the field will increase exponentially. It's instability. So these instabilities occur and they produce very quickly a very large number of particles. So there is a band structure in a Matthew equation, it's well known, for certain values of Q and A, which is a couple of A that is writing. Okay? A is larger than Q, so you have all these bands. So this means that the Flockett index, it's called Flockett index because it's related to an analogous phenomenon in a solid state. The wave number, for a given value of the wave number, you might be in a narrow resonance regime or in a broad resonance regime. That is, many modes k would be in resonance, yeah, which high pressure numbers due to very large values of the Fourier index. So if we are in the narrow resonance, then the behavior of field is what I was describing, just like a string. It's amplitude growing exponentially. Okay. The number density grows exponentially. I wrote here the log. So this is essentially a linear this would be the narrow resonance, but in the broad resonance, that's not what happens. In the broad resonance, right when the field phi goes through zero, there is a burst of particles. As phi becomes approximately constant, so when you're at the top, it very slowly evolves, so you're up there, it's, its velocity is zero, then it comes back again, here it's zero, again, up, again. Through those stages, the mass of the chi field is approximately constant. So you can define perfectly well the Fox space for this field. You know exactly what are the occupation numbers of that field. You know the asymptotic uh, Fox space. You can rewrite your uh, equation and equation operators. You know exactly what are the occupation numbers. And you can ask what will happen. This is like a scattering process. 
you start with one initial condition, this perfectly well-defined fork space, you have a time-dependent potential interaction, which gives you larger number of uh, particles in the out state, which itself becomes the in state for the next uh, oscillation or scattering, and so on. So we use this uh, behavior which affects the fault space of the field to compute the growth of the occupation numbers. And these occupation numbers start to grow exponentially. There will be steps by which they grow. Hmm? The time when the field fire is rapidly uh, accelerating, you cannot define properly a fault space, you cannot define it. Therefore, the number of particles at that stage. That's the origin of the speed. Do not take those uh, properly to count. The only thing that you can believe are these numbers, the steps. Okay, of course, if you're not in static uh, universe, but you're actually expanding, then as you expand, the amplitude of the field will decrease, so you're no longer exactly in phase. It might happen that you're pushing the field chi at a different uh, off pace with the production of particles, and therefore, rather than producing, you destroy particles. So, in an expanding universe, this growth of occupation numbers are sensitive to this expansion and eventually will make both the scale of the oscillation as well as the occupation number vary in time. Okay? So, in general, you will have bands numbers, for those k's, this is k, which grow, which then rescatter which themselves produce the back reaction and scattering is moving out of the spectrum, which as time progresses will move to high and high momentum. So during preheating, most of the modes that are produced and again redistributed their energy through scatterings will populate the high moment, the, the low momentum modes. Okay? Long wavelength, low momentum. Okay. It's, it's an infrared effect. Yes? It's the Hubble horizon somewhere. Here. So what would the Hubble horizon be? Oh, no, no, no. Like, over there. Five percent. No, not frozen modes. No, no, no. There's not, sorry, not, not over there. This is high K here. No, no. These are definitely within the horizon. Sorry, it is, it is a relevant issue. Okay. So what I'm going to describe here uh, has nothing to do with the production of particles during inflation, which are stretched outside the horizon. These are all causal phenomena that occur when within the horizon of inflation at the end. Okay. So this is going to excite modes of fields that couple to the inflator inside the horizon. Okay. So it is true that it's an infrared effect, but of course it will be cut off. This is the reason for this. It will be cut off at the horizon scale. Beyond the horizons, there are no production of particles. Okay. That's crucial. Of course, this will occur in each patch of the universe simultaneously, so they will be produced over all scales. But they will not be correlated with the same thing. Okay? That's important. Thank you. Right, something that I wanted to emphasize. Okay, if very quickly those fields acquire a competition, we can write the occupation number in this way. So here you have an effective temperature. Note that you have not yet thermalized, not at all. The only thing you're doing is increasing the occupation numbers okay, for higher and higher momentum. And this decreases, since the energy is shared among all, it decreases the amplitude and this, as this moves forward. But you can work out what is the effective temperature of such a quote unquote, was he a Bosch Einstein mode, mode for, for the field kind. Okay? This effective temperature will be extremely large compared to the preheating temperature. And it is those properties which are going to play a role for the entrance of the universe. Okay. So let's see the very rich terminology that we can use. Non thermal production of particles, production of topological defects, neurogenesis, radiation. Let's start with Oh, this is another uh, instance. I, I forgot that I had it here, but it, it is important that I mention it. Okay, tachyonic preheating has features which are very different from what I have just described. Rather than having a scalar field which is oscillating, what happens here is that the field to which the inflaton couples acquires a negative mass term. Negative mass terms also introduce instabilities which makes mode grow exponentially, and therefore you also will have a very large production of particles. But they do not come because of subsequent crossings of the field phi through zero, which enhance the production of particles, but through direct, in a few, in less than one uh, oscillation, the production of particles very fast. And this occurs in the specific models of inflation, which are different from the usual small inflation, chaotic models, but they occur in higher inflation. 
Remember that pilot inflation, I think I have a picture here. Let me go to the picture first. Here we go. Pilot inflation. Remember you have your inflaton field, which is your chi. I changed notation here to keep phi the symmetry breaking field. So your inflaton goes down in potential. There's a moment where the coupling between the inflaton and the Higgs allows for the mass square term to vanish. So this sets the end of inflation because it makes those fluctuations very quickly grow and reach the minimum of the potential, and the energy density is very suddenly finished. So inflation ends around here. Now, it's quite interesting because this field phi, which is your Higgs field, Higgs not necessarily uh, your electroweak Higgs model, could be some grand unified uh, Higgs, would acquire instabilities because of negative mass. Here, you see the negative mass. Okay, this is the usual case you know, potential, which would break the symmetry. Mm -hmm. And I'm accounting for some possible vacuum manifold. So I'm writing here, this is not chi and phi, this is the phases of phi, okay, which allow you for this extra V1 mm -hmm. that I'm writing here. So in chi and phi, these are the trajectories that the classical fluids will move, but they will be dominated by quantum fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So let us write this. Let's suppose that we have an abelian Higgs inflaton model. So it is here, I'm sorry, I should have taken away this A because this is a billion. There's no index for the atrium. This is your trace of the uh, kinetic term for the Higgs. It is coupled through this potential that I wrote here to the inflaton. This would be your inflaton, the coupling of the inflaton to the Higgs, and the Higgs acquiring F through this the usual Higgs potential. Okay? So you have covariant derivatives in the gauge field and its field strength. So we see from this coupling, let me go to here, you see from here that there will be a value of chi. The first term, mass term, is minus lambda v squared over 4. So essentially minus m squared phi squared. Okay? So with a minus sign. But there are values of chi above some critical value for which the mass of the Higgs is positive. That's how you get these terms. Beyond which, for chi is more than a certain critical value, this term wins. Okay? And then it becomes, when chi is zero, when chi is zero, it becomes dominant by just simply the symmetry breaking term. Okay? So this what happens is that as you go across this chi critical, the mass of the field becomes zero. You go from positive to negative. So it's easy to work out what is the time scale that this takes place. It's linear in time and it has a constant, v, the velocity, and m cube. You can write this as some capital M, r. And therefore, the Hamiltonian that the Higgs field satisfies is of this type. This is a theoretically conjugate momentum, with the Higgs, this is the Higgs value. This is the mass square, which, as you can see, depends on frequency and time. OK, so. The equations can be solved exactly. This will give rise to IE equations. You can work out the time dependence given some initial conditions for the fields and for the canonically conjugate momentum, P. You can work this quantity which gives rise to the squeezing or, or quick growth of the occupation numbers and compute some quantum initial conditions as a Gaussian random field. Remember the field as it goes before it reaches the m squared equals zero uh, place, its fluctuations actually give you some width. It's Gaussian. It's still its ground state. And when it crosses m squared uh, to negative values, those modes start to grow exponentially. So the evolution is unitary. You can evolve this exactly, and you can compute the occupation modes. At any time t in the vacuum, from the initial condition given by whatever number of particles you had initially in your heat field. So what we observe, this is in 2003, 2004, we observe that the growth of occupation numbers dramatic very soon in short interval of time, this is tau, you will have occupation numbers growing in the long wave region very much like what we had in parameter presence. Okay? Now, of course, very soon those modes are no longer um, independent. Those modes couple to each other through the lambda 5 fourth term. 
And therefore, the Higgs not only grows in occupation numbers, it will increase their chances of interaction with itself through the self-coupling. And this would mean that there would be back reaction and rescattering. Those nodes which are very strongly uh, populated in occupation number will rescatter. So this uh, first order uh, approximation is not enough to continue the evolution. We have to put this into the lattice. We can use, given that the large occupation number uh, allows us to treat this as a wave, as a classical wave, we can put this in the lattice and evolve as if they were classical fields, both the inflaton and the Higgs. And what's, that's exactly what we did. The only thing we have to put is initial conditions to be in agreement with what you would expect from the end of inflation. That is, convert your quantum field, free field, into a Gaussian random field with such a random distribution. So this is what we evolved. It's an old image. Uh, I'm sorry, I was right to it. Let me go forward and I'll show you those snapshots. So first, a few bubbles will form. These are two-dimensional hypersurfaces in X and Y, and this is a field phi. So what you observe is you start producing a, a peak in phi. So phi is moving along this direction. So you have your initial distribution, you gather around the field, it's moving along this direction of your potential. It runs until it goes to a maximum value, so it runs until it gets here. The peak of it reaches first, and then it starts coming down. So it invaginates. It creates a wall. There is no phase transition here. It's just simply the fact that you have a value, a maximum value, for phi, and therefore while this one decreases, it's still the surrounding uh, positions in space are still growing. Okay? So the center drops while the rest grows until eventually you settle here, as you can see through a series of interactions. Now, on the way, of course, other bubbles are formed. And these bubbles will hit each other, and they will produce gravitational waves. In fact, if you treat this as the electroweak Higgs, then at the places where they hit, you would also have a chance of producing over-the-barrier transitions. And as I will show, produce barriers. So this is a very complicated nonlinear phenomenon that cannot be treated analytically. What we did observe is that those oscillations could be uh, described in certain equations, at least initially, and this allowed us to compute some of the quantities that are not shown. Imagine that we have a field a complex field, and we are drawing from its illusion right at the end of inflation what is the distribution of values of the field in real and imaginary bodies. What we observe right at the end of inflation is that they are distributed right, along a ring. Okay? So if your U1 it's a gauge U1, so that you could arbitrarily at any position in space make a phase rotation, okay, then the only thing you're observing, all of these would be equivalent. The only thing you would observe, observe is that the Higgs finally breaks the symmetry and it's around the minimum. So this would be the way the Higgs symmetry breaking would occur. We see in a dynamical way how from positive mass squared to the Higgs vacuum, we go from a distribution that was centered around the false vacuum and then the true vacuum. Now, if that symmetry is not the gauge symmetry but a global symmetry, then you're left with a string right in the center. Okay? Why? Because if this is just a global symmetry, that means that in different directions you have different orientations. Okay? So in, in the distribution of field values, you have all possible orientations right, in different positions in space. And this gives rise to cosmic strings. In fact, we observe this. Cosmic strings are formed and they thin out until they disappear. So this is a tremendously effective way of producing strings right at the end of inflation, as long as the vacuum at the end of inflation is not trivial. You could have some walls, if this is a set two symmetry, you could have 
string, you could have monopole, you could have you name it. Okay? Of course, we don't know how many infinite strings there are. The boxes that we dealt with are finite, much more than the size of the horizon. We don't know what is the distribution of infinite strings that will give rise through scaling to the distribution that uh, would affect or would be seen in the late universe. We still have not shown that there is a scaling, but we do expect that it would happen. So, okay. so you need a global U1 for this? Probably this string, yes. This is where now. Yeah. Were they able to put it the same ways? The strings? Yeah. After they are uh, produced? Yes. The loops of the strings, okay, when they contract, they generate the shock waves. Mm -hmm. They do as much as any other string does. There is no difference. What has been different is the initial conditions. The initial conditions are not thermal phase transitions. They are the initial conditions of preheating. Okay? So that's why I was asking about infinite strings. The thing with the uh, uh, phase transitions, thermal phase transitions, is that you can correlate over very large distances those strings. And then you can ask whether a single infinite string would give rise to loops, which will then enter into scaling. But the fact that they are cosmic strings, ordinary cosmic strings, imply that indeed they will have they will produce a closed loops through inter interactions and they will decay producing scale. So then this model will have two sources of additional waves. Yes. And the stress on the field. And we will see that even the process that produces those will generate gravitational waves. How much time have I got before the little break? Twenty minutes overall. Twenty minutes overall. Ah. Okay, then let's stop here because I want to tell you about uh, electronic paragenesis uh, and also primary black hole. So let's stop here for for a while, and then we while meaning two minutes in uh, particles. It's very efficient also uh, in a stage which is very far from equilibrium. So it might have all the conditions that we need in order to produce the battery symmetry. Now, if these things occur, this right at the electroweak transition, if you had features in the, in the evolution of the universe which uh, freezed out the evolution, stopped, and made the Higgs again reheat the universe, this is something which still do not know whether it has happened or not. So whether there has been a second stage of inflation right at the electroweak scale, some kind of thermal inflation which has stopped and then re reheated the universe. If such a phenomenon occur at the electroweak scale, then we can use the Higgs that we know of. Good old Higgs, that's you should cross you one, to uh, through the inflation zone generate the barriers. So, what are the conditions that one requires in order to produce barium symmetry? We all know. Back in 67, Sakharov realized that we need barium violation, C and CP violation, and we need to be out of the program. <laughs> now, the barium violation is already within the standard model. C and CP violation through the CKA metrics has a certain amplitude. It's probably not enough to produce, at least in the thermal case, enough barogenesis. And the out of equilibrium, condition, it's not satisfied with the electroweak theory. Simply because it's a cross -off. We know that if it was just a thermal expansion, we would not produce sufficiently a first order transition to produce the out of equilibrium requirement. Okay? So through this crossover, you would simply do not you wash out all the barriers. Now, here's where preheating occurs, where preheating comes to the rescue and may produce through a, its out of equilibrium conditions the production of so here, rather than having the U1, a billion kicks, we have the SU2, or U1 kicks, if it's a model, we'll see how this SU2 will become the final U1, or the minimum. So here we do have this A terms, we have the coupling, the SU2 coupling, the one billion uh, field strength, and again the rest is the same. Okay? So here's something new that we have not considered until now, which is the fact that the standard model has certain charges which are related to some global symmetries, the B minus L, or actually both barren and lepton number, which are global symmetries, accidental symmetries of the standard model Lagrangian. We don't know its, their origin. They could come from some granulified 
uh, description, which has broken down to our group, is it two cross, is it three cross, is it two cross, two one. But we know that if there are those um, global symmetries, there are terms in the Lagrangian which we have not described until then, which must be included. In particular, there are terms in the Lagrangian which are topological numbers, total derivatives, and therefore they need to be uh, included in the first case, but whose values, when you integrate over, give you charges, James Simon's charges, which will characterize the vacuum of your theory, will characterize whether you have a certain, uh, you're in a certain vacuum or not. Now, in the case of QCD and SU3, we know that this gives rise to the famous axiom vacuum. We can go through the, the, U1, the chiral U1 of, of the axiom. We can describe, characterize this by uh, different numbers. There's not only a, a chiral uh, winding number for the axiom, there's also for SU2. In SU2, this chiral uh, number is called the Chensak number. It can be written as the integral over space time of the term that appears in the Lagrangian, the FF dual term, times the coupling. So this gives rise to a charge, since I'm charge, which we integrate in space and in time to give you a number. A number which you can put its discrete number, it's quantized. And we can compute the rate of change of chain signals through this equation. Sorry, that's the trace of the number. The trace of F F dual. This is there should be A here. So F F dual. It's a total derivative, right? Okay, and it gives through its integral, it gives a number, right? But you're taking a trace of that. No, That's right. Trace is just simply something over a. I think mu, the, the left, something over left a. mu and the right mu should be different, different instead. It's a matrix. Ah, okay. So it's not. These are all primitives, and I'm, I'm I'm tracing over a. Just that it looks like it's traced over mu and mu, but instead two no, no, no. should remain free. Right, yes, of course. course. So, yeah. No, the trace is not. Yeah. Otherwise, I didn't have to put the trace. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> so this rate will be crucial in order to produce the barrier. We did again numerical simulations like we did uh, previously for the uh, Abelian Higgs, and we observed that in certain places, indeed, the production of Chen Samus number was very prominent. In certain places, we produced Chen Samus, which create a, a large peak, which we could integrate and, and see. And this is the places where those bubbles collided. Mm -hmm. In similar uh, figures of the one I showed, when those bubbles collided, there's a chance that uh, one of those windings around the zero may go up the potential and then wind around. This creates a peak in terms of charge. And this is a place where you can produce barriers. And how do we produce variants? <laughs> Through the anomaly, which relates one with the other. So what is happening is that as the inflaton uh, goes through zero and the Higgs uh, grows very fast, the coupling of the inflaton to the Higgs makes the uh, chain cycle number vary in time. You have also the potential barrier, which separates the different vacua. Remember, the chain cycle number is characterized by an integer, the variation of the chain cycle number. Which one them themselves not? It's the, the difference. Yeah? It's a it's an integer. So the barrier which separates the different vacua mm -hmm. in the electric theory at zero temperature is a tremendously large barrier. The probability of tunneling is very strongly suppressed. Ten to the minus fifty one hundred and fifty seven is a number which is even smaller than the cosmological constant of black units. Yeah? However, in the early universe, if this phenomenon occurred that the Higgs Okay. It's been produced out of the inflaton, coupling to the inflaton. This means that the barrier is rising and diminishing because the mass of the Higgs itself is changing as a function of time. Okay? And this changes the barrier. That means that there are higher probabilities of one of those events to go and change. Chen Simon number, therefore, barrier number. Why is Chen Simon number related to barrier number? That's because of the property of the uh, electroweak theory, which is that they Baryonic current, that which you can straightforwardly uh, construct with the left-handed fermions of the standard model, are conserved at the classical level, but they are they have an anomaly 
they are not conserved at the quantum level. And the difference, the non-conservation of these currents is directly related to this topological charge. It's proportional to Q. That means that through the kind of anomaly, which makes these two currents not conserved at the quantum level, you can relate the chain sandwich number that we produce at the end of inflation with the barrier number. Of course, we have to be very careful because there are a configurations called sphalerons, which could wash out any junk that we produce to produce the same number would be washed out. Except if you have an effective operator like this one, which couples the heights to F of dual, you could have added to the Lagrangian before, which has an amplitude and a typical scale. Because in this case, your effective interaction, new effective, which is, did I write it here? No. Let me see whether I have it somewhere else. Yes, here it is. The effective chemical potential is related to the time variation of the expectation value of the Higgs. And therefore, it changes when it has a certain sign. Higgs is oscillating. So there's a moment where the barriers are low enough that these transitions can occur. So you start producing barrier. But when you're in the opposite phase, those transitions cannot occur because the barrier has gone up. So you're changing the chemical potential at the same time you're changing the barrier. So you're preferentially producing barriers, but when you would have produced anti-barriers, and they would have decay weight, washed out the, the asymmetry, the barrier is much higher. This is something which is extremely efficient. It's actually a resonant effect, and you produce barriers very quickly. So it's a very efficient way of producing barriers. It's so efficient that if you compute, you solve the Boltzmann equation, and you compute what is the amount of ratio of, of barriers to, to entropy, this thing that which is 10 to the minus 10, you get this number. So the coefficient in the operator doesn't have to be tiny in order to produce a very small number. It's OK it's having one point of equilibrium to give the observed uh, barrier symmetry. So the electric symmetry breaking through the coupling to the inflaton right at the end of inflation could be responsible for the production of barriers, thanks to this, this firearms and in the bottom of that OK. <coughs> I was going to go over primordial magnetic field production. It's clearly, uh, I don't have that much time. And we're finishing the lectures today. So I will very quickly jump on the, let me go spread it directly here, to the production of gravitational waves, and then so you've seen that the phenomenon of a preheating is very violent. Okay, you've seen those waves which heat each other at relativistic speeds, which contain a huge fraction of the energy density of the inflaton, and those very relativistic, very massive uh, waves of matter will collide to produce gravitational waves. So the only thing we need is to write down the equations for those gravitational waves and see what are the sources. So again, with the Higgs inflaton model, this here, when you go to the transverse traceless gauge for the metric, you take into account the back reaction. Then you work out what is the equation for the engineering, sorry, for the uh, gravitational wave amplitude. It has a source. During inflation, this is the only term that drives the expansion of the universe and produces the perturbations that we observe or may observe in the polarization of the CMB. But right at the end of inflation, the thing which was essentially zero during inflation, because it was second order of very tiny amplitudes, and remember this is second order in the fluctuation of the inflaton, it would be completely negligible during inflation. At the end of inflation, it's not negligible because the energy in those modes is huge. And therefore, you have a very large anisotropic stress tensor, written this way, which is a source of gravitational waves and which allows us to compute the gravitational wave energy density. Very simple. As an expectation value of the solution in long scales of the variation in time of uh, the transfer stress tensor. Okay? The energy density, which is normalized to the vacuum, can be written this way, and therefore, omega in gravitational waves. Again, written to this quantity, which itself relates to this one. And here's the plot, which is a uh, long story short. You have 
your inflaton, which covers the Higgs, eventually reaching a, a competition. And at the same time, this rapid growth of the Higgs produces a very quick production of radiation waves, whose energy reaches a millionth of the total energy density. In just a few oscillations, soon after, there will be a back reaction, and there will be a turbulent regime, which will still give you a slight increase in the amplitude of the gravitational waves. But the main driver is this exponential growth of the amplitude of gravitational waves. Now, what is the spectrum? The spectrum, we did this with different data sizes, and we observed that it had a KQ dependence and a very sharp, rapid exponential fall off, with a peak at around in K over M of 10, which in gravitational wave frequencies is about 10 to the 10. Um, okay, how are we going to measure this uh, spectrum? Through, you all know about the uh, gravitational wave emission of pulsars. Through the detection of waves which reach you and perturb the arms of a laser interferometer. These transparencies I made before uh, LIGO. So after LIGO, everybody knows this. So I don't have to go into them. However, there are some things which are relevant, which will be crucial. And that's the relation between the omega gravitational waves and the amplitude, which will allow us to uh, determine whether this uh, interferometer will be able to be sensitive to those. So there are a series of interferometers from LIGO to ESA, possibly in the future SIGO in between, which now have made detection, I hope, hopefully in the future we will also, and therefore we have to uh, ask whether these interferometers will be able to uh, be sensitive to the gravitational wave background. And unfortunately, even though the gravitational wave amplitude is sufficiently large to have something like 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12, on very high frequencies, compared to 10 to the minus 15 of inflation, this is extremely high, this is a high peak in the spectrum, they occur at so high frequencies, in terms of gigahertz, that we're out of the range of these interferometers, as we know, which are mostly kilohertz. In the gigahertz, those gravitational waves are very short wavelengths. They carry a lot of energy, nearly electron volt energy, in fact. And their way of detecting is radically different from those of the laser interferometer. We will need some other type of detector. If I have time, I'll go into that. One of those solid detectors, like the spheres in, in space or satellites. Who knows what? <laughs> For long, there's, there's no there's no experiment to, to search. Okay, but let's let's put this in context. Okay, so from hybrid inflation, you expect this kind of peak. Okay, at something like ten to the nine or ten to the ten hertz. But if the model of inflation occurs at sufficiently low scales. That is, the size of the horizon is, is much, much larger, for instance, if this occurred at the electroweak scale, then the whole picture shifts and decreases in amplitude. Okay? So it might be that there is a background of radiation waves from inflation, from the end of inflation, in this hybrid model, which could have an amplitude much bigger than that of gut inflation, which is 10 to minus 15, and still be below the detectability of that. If this is here or not here, that's still under discussion. Whether there could be a gravitational wave background right in the region where we could detect it with the, in the future with these. Okay. So uh, this is the summary I was I using yesterday. Um, let me stop here and tell you about the uh, primordial mm -hmm. So it seems that not only do we have a gravitational waves, not only do we have it from the end of inflation, do we have a possibility of producing the barriers at preheating magnetic fields, which I didn't have time to go over. Um, all the phenomena of very large scales, like the large scale structure of the CME, all of those phenomena which cover a huge range of scales uh, might be might allow us to test or, or at least put constraints on what was the early universe physics. Now, recently we realized that it's not just these which open a window into the early universe. There's also the possibility that something peculiar may occur before we end inflation, before we get to n equals zero. 
at intermediate values of the number of reforms. And this is possibility of a peak in the power spectrum. So, let me describe to you very briefly. Let me go here. So, the possibility that primordial black holes produced during inflation might be responsible for uh, the dark matter. So, something which we realized again in the context of hybrid inflation many, many years ago, is that one could produce density homogeneity as a peak in the density in the spectrum, which would produce black holes, and moreover, constitute all of the dark matter. It's something which we uh, said 20 years ago. As I said quite often, our problem is not that we take our theories too seriously, but that we don't take them seriously enough. And it took us 10 to 15 years to reanalyze this again in 2015 with Sebastian Kress. And we realized that if indeed there was such a behavior in the hybrid inflation that produced a peak, that peak would not be narrow. It would be very broad. And if it's broad in half, it contains, it brings together new phenomena that I will describe in much better in detail you know, on Monday. But at least it gives you a distribution of masses for the primordial black holes, which could see the black holes at the center of the galaxies at high redshift, could be the source of photo and x ray sources, could start structure formation much earlier, and we'll see what are the physics. Moreover, we predicted in 2015, before the actual measurement of LIGO, that primordial black hole binaries should have gravitational waves and be detected. Not only binaries, but also a background of gravitational waves. So we have done both. We predicted what was the rate at which those black holes today would merge, and therefore compared with the detection of LIGO, as well as predicted the stochastic background of gravitational waves for those black holes from the moment recombination started to allow the, the merging of those black holes. Now, what do we need? We've, we've had a long discussion about the uh, arbitrariness in the potential of the inflow. Okay, the only thing we need is that high values of the field, fine. We give fluctuations that determine the amplitude of fluctuations in the CMB and later on the natural structure. But we don't know anything about what happens in between. Whether this is an M squared or five squared model or it's a flat potential like Stravinsky model, we're not probing yet the intermediate scales. Okay, we're discussing this this morning. So it might perfectly happen that at some point there is an inflection in the potential, a flat plateau. If that happens, rather than having a flat lambda quadrant matter spectrum with an amplitude 10 to the minus 5, which decreases to higher k, that is, on small scales, it's even smaller, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 10, perhaps. There might be a peak, and this is what we predicted in 1996, because of the transition right at the end of hybrid inflation between the massive, massive mass square for the Higgs to negative mass square. This peak rapid growth of fluctuations, if there are a few efforts after the transition, and therefore are allowed to be stretched to larger scales, and then later on re-enter the horizon, would collapse to form black holes. Imagine you have a horizon after inflation, which is growing in time, and a fluctuation which has the same amplitude which enters the horizon at that time. There will be gradients yeah, in those fluctuations which are of order one that are much larger, they induce a force which is much larger, curvature force, which is much larger than pressure. Even for a radiation dominated fluid, there's nothing that would prevent collapse if the curvature fluctuation is large and the gradients of order one. This is known since the 80s, fluctuations of order one producing such gradients because of peaks in the power spectrum would collapse to form black holes. Of course, not all domains, not all horizons at the time of re-entry will fall to form a black hole. There will be a probability, pressure the formalism, the exponentially suppressed, so there will be very few. But all the mass which is within the horizon will collapse to form a black hole. This will give you the mass of the black hole. The larger the horizon, the later in time, the bigger the black hole. 
black holes that are produced right at the end of infiltration would have evaporated immediately after. Black holes that took, say, 20 e before the end of inflation and therefore re enter the horizon much later would still be refactored. They could have solar mass or so. So, this is where this picture allows us to connect the early universe, our shape of the potential, say, 20 e or so, before the end of inflation, with physics that we can measure, the physics of dark matter. Now, what we realize this uh, 10 or 20 years later is that the peak is not narrow as we thought initially. There are quantum fluctuations that before the, the potential opens up to become a negative mass square for the Higgs, before that happens, quantum fluctuations are actually shifting the value of the field and therefore inducing through back reaction a very large amplitude of the perturbation. So rather than having a peak, right at the time when you have a symmetry breaking, this is actually a very broad peak. Smaller in amplitude, but much wider. This means that if we look at the CMB, we don't see any features. If we look at the realization epoch, we might start to see the rise of the power spectrum because of the width of this peak. And eventually, through the formation of the first structures, galaxies that range obtain, quasars of class 6, we can determine the, whether they had been sourced through seeds that were primarily the cause of, say, hundreds of solar masses. Okay, something very peculiar of this scenario, rather than the single peak, which would give you just a single mass, is that when a fluctuation enters the horizon at a given time, remember how we had this one-to-one uh, -one mapping okay, of scales. So fluctuations that enter earlier, which have a smaller uh, wavelength, higher k, those have a smaller masses, so you produce black holes which are smaller. As time passes, this fluctuation will leave on a fluctuation that existed before, because the power spectrum is much larger here. Therefore, it's much probable that even a smaller fluctuation would collapse to form a black hole. This is similar to how galaxies form very close to peaks in the power spectrum and form clusters. Okay? Here, we form clusters not of galaxies, but of primordial black holes, still during the radiation level. Okay? So we are producing different scales enter, the longer it takes, the larger the horizon, the larger the mass. Okay? So we are going to have clusters of black holes, primordial black holes, formed before Big Bang nucleosynthesis. These clusters will be highly isolated from each other. Okay? they would have very low probability in their total energy density compared to that of radiation. Eventually, their energy density, which scales like 1 over the volume, because they dilute like ordinary matter, they are zero pressure fluid, these will become dominant at equality, and they will become the dark matter. Okay. While well, radiation has, has been diluted. So, there are specific models, type of hybrid inflation time, which can be used to compute this uh, power spectrum, and it has this shape, yes. the power spectrum curvature, as a function of e -fold. So models like this, or like this, are perfectly consistent with observations and have a very large challenge. Of course, these will already be in, in problems, right? the same between this record. So, once you form them, the probability of finding a given mass per unit volume is tiny. Most of those models do not have a sufficient uh, amount. The energy density with respect to the total is negligible as a function of mass. But, at the time of the quality, when you integrate over mass, this is the of uh, d over m, you integrate this probability function over mass, we find that right at equality, all these different models produce all that there is in dark matter. You could produce all the dark matter units. The, the rest, 0.08 at the time of equality, are the barriers. Okay? So, since then, these black holes, they act as seeds, and they start forming structure. And you may ask, this is something which uh, is relevant, whether we've already seen those, or if not, what are the constraints today? 
So the constraints today come from a plethora of uh, observations. The most stringent ones are from the CMB, from white virus, and from microlensing. Okay. From microlensing, we know that if we would have had a black hole of a mass of, say, a tenth of a solar mass, or a hundredth of a solar mass, or a planet size, a black hole in between us and the large magnetic cloud, and they would be evenly distributed, not clustered, but evenly distributed, then the probability of being seen would have been uh, close to one for the number of stars that have been observed in the large magnetic cloud. And therefore, the fact that they have not been observed in sufficient numbers put constraints on the distribution of primary black holes of masses between about 10 and 10 to minus 7. Moreover, if you have primordial black holes before recombination, these black holes attract gas. The gas will accelerate and re-inject energy back into the plasma. This re-injection of energy is going to change the Planckian distribution, the Planckian spectrum of photons. It's going to give you a high tail of the distribution. There are very strong constraints coming from a COVID virus experiment that you cannot raise the tail of the distribution arbitrarily high. There are two quantities, the Y parameter and the uh, mu parameter, both uh, the chemical potential and the uh, uh, ionization parameter, Y, which are below 1 part in 10 to the 5. The constraints from the virus just touch uh, at around 100 or so solar masses. They widely move to the right with the what was soon initial. Then you have white binaries, that is, binaries that are observed in our galaxy, which are very wide apart. The potential is very shallow, and therefore, if you have a black hole which passes by relatively close to it, explaining the rotation curves of galaxies, gives you a certain distance between black holes. And if you have one of these black holes passing by, it will disrupt the binary, and the binary has been observed to be orbiting for millions of years, and therefore, if you see that those barriers are still in place, that puts constraints yeah, on your black holes. So there is a gap around here. Of course, we don't need to have 100% of all the masses. If you had a delta function, just a very narrow one, the SCP, for instance, in 100 uh, solar masses, if you had a narrow, then if all of the dark matter is in one more black holes, you better have this gap here empty of constraints. Now, in the case of probability black holes with a wide uh, distribution, then since the whole integral is going to give you the total mass, you still can have the, the amplitude well below 10%. Okay? So probability black holes of the kind that we were discussing in 2015 were perfectly in agreement. We predicted that they would be seen by LIGO, and indeed, it has been observed. I want to emphasize, these are not the primary black holes of Carr uh, et which were tiny. Some of them would, would be evaporating. They're actually very massive, between 100 and 10 to the 5. They would cluster and merge, and among others, it might solve some of the uh, very big problems of lambda CD and Carr. If I have time, I'll go into them. If not, you can ask me. Okay? So this is the picture. The mass distribution is as follows. You have the stellar mass black holes, those that are produced from usual stellar evolution, supernovae, gravitational collapse of, of gas, which have a tail which very quickly falls, actually it's faster than this, about 10 or so uh, solar masses. Then you have the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, quasars, and so on, which have their own distribution. Intermediate mass black holes, yeah, which have properties which are not that dissimilar from those of supermassive black holes. And our claim is that primordial black holes, which exceeded both the intermediate mass black holes at the center of globular clusters and dwarf spheroidals, and the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, they all have a common origin. And they all come from the same phenomenon, seeds in the galaxy formation. And these are quantities which correlate the mass of the black hole in solar masses for the very supermassive black holes observed, and the velocity dispersion at the center. And there is a linear relation. Very clear, supermassive intermediate mass black hole. This is not my work, it's Chris and I, 2013. So there seems to be gaps here in the distribution, which I claim will be filled in. There will be better detections that will allow to show that there are 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 total mass black holes out there. Moreover, that there are black holes at 10 to the 3. 
and tell the truth. These are at the center of torture for oil. And we recently published one paper from Eridanos where we claim that there's a 1500 solar mass black hole at the center of Eridanos in order to explain the stability of a cluster of stars there. We saw that with the dark energy survey. So there's a chance that these two holes will be filled in and there will be a uniform okay, distribution or, or relationship between the formation of structure that we know of at all scales. This would be the seas that has created all the structure that we observe. It started being black holes, it accreted gas, it formed uh, an object which shall in shine, and then these would merge progressively to form the larger and larger objects. Okay? So initially a distribution which had tails that had sufficiently massive black holes, like 10 to the 3 or so, so massive black holes, they would form the first objects that we are in as the universe, they would form the first galaxies, we would be seen in as quasars. Okay? So how would we distinguish this black hole from stellar black holes? First, typically stellar black holes, if they come with a companion, would have accretion this. These are isolated black holes. The distribution of spins is very different. Those black holes from gravitational collapse of gas, be it through the supernova or through bond accretion, it will collapse by a, inducing a large spin of the black hole. There will be conservation factor momentum and linear momentum. So typically those black holes would be highly spinning. Moreover, when you produce those black holes, like it happens with neutron stars, these black holes, by conservation of linear momentum, will get a kick. So it's very difficult to produce black holes in binaries that will remain together without spin, as the LIGO observations seem to suggest. So these two black holes, which are orbiting each other, they will either have a very fast spin, or they would not even be bound together because of this linear kick, which has thrown the, the black hole out of the, uh, out of the binary. So these black holes at formation are extremely difficult uh, to, to remain bounded compared to the static primordial black holes, which are formed as clusters. They keep on accreting because they are very close together. You don't have to bring a very massive black hole far away, which is very difficult to produce, to another one which is so far away that it would take ages before these black holes would merge. It takes billions of billions of years for the energy in the emission of gravitational waves to make those two things get together. However, if they are clustered, it's very natural. We will immediately very quickly do that. Actually, we have a start emerging from a combination of orbits. Then we form the galactic seeds on which gas is formed. You could, looking at long duration events, and this is something which is puzzled me for a long time. Why did people stop monitoring the light of stars from the large magnetic cloud after five or six years? And the reason is, if you don't expect massive compact halo objects to have a mass more than 10 solar masses, you should not go forward. Why? Because the time it takes for the light curve of these microlensing events is essentially of a year or so for a 10 solar mass. If you have a 100 solar mass, it would take three or four years. Okay? And therefore, things that are very massive would take much longer to monitor, you would have to keep on looking for those objects for much longer. But why would they go to higher than 10 masses if there is no mechanism, sterile mechanism, to produce black holes of those large masses? Not until LIGO came to show us that there were black holes of 30 solar masses, did anyone think that there was a possibility of very massive black holes being formed. Well, here's the other way around. It's very natural to have very massive black holes. But not only very massive black holes, you could also have very low mass black holes, something that from the point of view of astrophysics is completely impossible because of the um, Chandrasekhar limit. You don't expect to have 0.1 solar mass black holes today. So if we ever observe 0.1 solar mass black holes inspiringly in, unfortunately LIGO's frequency range is not good enough for this, and sensitivity, you might have to wait for the SIGO, then that's the perfect telltale for a primordial black hole. Stars would never form. Black holes do not split up. Yes, Jose. Will this change with modified gravity? I doubt it. It would have to change so much that it would have already have not as modified gravity. Mm -hmm. no, At the level of, of gravitational collapse mm -hmm. to form black holes. Mm -hmm. 
it would what? It would be the hypervector we're dealing with. So only in, in hypervector. Yeah, these very compact objects. And like, uh, so okay. Go for it. <laughs> maybe it's worth maybe it's worth exploring whether you can have more than one solar sort of master. Change the Chandra Seca limit with a strong gravity. Perhaps I have no doubt. Right. So <laughs> something else which is it's worth seeing is, of course, if you have a black hole out there in the halo, the probability of one of those black holes encountering the star is, is very small. But once they are encountered, it would affect very strongly the dynamics of the star. Okay. In particular, let me go through this. This, this would be uh, fast. This was the expression here. Mm -hmm. Diagonal position for velocity analysis. What has been the standard paradigm until recently was this particle dark matter scenario, yeah, which would be particles distributed uniformly over the halo and stars moving in this background field. By Gauss law, these stars do not fill the particles. Okay. Mm -hmm. They only fill the potential well due to the rest of the galaxies in, in its neighborhood. Okay. Now, if you concentrate all that volume into a single point, primordial black hole scenario, where you have black holes which are separated by 40 parsecs or so, the number of the stars which are around the vicinity mostly do not fill the potential well of the black hole, except if they are sufficiently close. This would induce an anomalous acceleration. Oops, did I compute? Just a moment. Here we go. And we compute what is the mass in the halo, which can be measured within 50 uh, kiloparsecs. We can compute what is the typical distance between uh, black holes. And this is like 38 parsecs for a 50 small mass black hole. Within this volume, you'd have 100,000 stars. And the chances that one of these stars will change its acceleration due to the presence of the black hole compared to the acceleration induced by the rest of the stars is really is an anomaly which is extremely small unless the star goes very close to the black hole. Okay? And this reminds you, that's why I call it the Thompson and the Rutherford model. This reminds you of the Rutherford experiment. Okay? So rather than having a uniform distribution of charge, Rutherford realized that by bombarding with alpha particles, some very few, most of them would go across the, the thin film, but some of them would just go right against it. That means it had found a very hard core. This is the same thing. If you have sufficiently close impact parameters, small impact parameter, the gravitational interaction with the black hole will change the acceleration of the star. And what it will do, in fact, is shoot the star out. So these velocities, you, you can compare what is the relative change in velocity or the relative displacement of a star at a kilopascal from mass. And this is in the milliard set. So it's within the sensitivity of the target. But let me, let me go back here. Yes. Hmm. Those few encounters of a stars on black holes, if the star gets sufficiently close, it will exchange energy and momentum with the black hole. It will do something similar to what a satellite does on Jupiter when you want to send probes to the outer solar system. What you do is you make yourself close enough to the gravitational potential well of Jupiter and then use the gravitational interaction to slingshot the satellite away. Okay? It's an exchange of energy momentum. Of course, Jupiter doesn't change much. It's the satellite which gets thrown out with tremendous velocities, the velocity of Jupiter. So it's very simple to derive those formulas depending on the ratio of the little mass of the star compared to the big mass of the black hole. This is, say, one solar mass. This is 100 solar masses. Okay, then you change the velocity of the star and convert it into the large velocity of the black hole. These black holes, by dynamical friction, tend to fall to the potential well of the object. Imagine that we are dealing here with a, a low mass dwarf asteroid, low mass object in our uh, orbiting our gas. Okay, it has certain mass in black holes, dark matter, and certain mass in stars. Those stars have a probability of interacting with the black holes. As the black holes tend to fall to the inner part, those stars that reach the black hole and exchange energy with the black hole will acquire a large velocity. But these dwarf phenomenals uh, have very small potential wells. So the escape velocity is huge. It acquires two times 
the velocity of the black hole just orbiting near the center, this exchange of energy will give them through one, two, or three, perhaps, slingshots, subsequent slingshots, sufficient energy to go out of the potential well of the daughter forever. So it's a way of playing golf with stars. So it's, you have a star, and the black hole, bang, throws the star out of the potential way of the dwarf ferro. So this would be a way to lose light in dwarf ferro. This could be a way how dwarf ferro diminish the amount of stars, they present large mass to light ratios, and you lose luminosity. And this may explain why we have not seen those many objects. The famous substructure problem or missing satellite problem of lambda curac matter. The argument would be that there are such objects out there, they're just simply too dim to be observed. And this is what, in, with the Dark Energy Survey, we have actually observed. By having very long exposures, we have brought up dwarf phenomena that we didn't know about. In fact, there's something like 18 of these. I think I have, I'm not sure whether I, yes, here they are. Okay, so let me go through the missing satellite and with this I end. Okay, this is the usual problem with a lambda product matter. If you do simulations, you see that galaxies are not isolated. They are surrounded by halos with many, many, many different uh, satellites, many, many different masses of satellites, which are distributed this way. Now, if you look at our galaxy, you see very few lower uh, numbers and smaller masses. So we're not reaching no way what we would expect for the galaxies, for instance, in, in clusters. Since the whole distribution of mass should be scaling varying, there's something missing here. Either we don't observe things that are there, or we have a different type of dark matter. And I'm going to argue that they are there, it's just simply we have not seen them. These are the number last year, or two years ago, of dwarf ephemerals orbiting our galaxy. They are here. As you see, there aren't so many famous ones, large and small magnetic clouds, Sagittarius, Scoper, Fornax, Draco, etc. These are the sixes of 30 kilobarsons. Now, with DS, we observed two years ago 18 new ones. And now we have a whole bunch of them. These are in the south. And if you extrapolate this, these were new, completely new. Nobody knows what to this. Out of this, only 18 have been uh, published. We, we already have measured 20 something. So if we extrapolate the area that DS had covers, 5,000 square degrees, to the full sky, you fill up your substructure problem. So this is just a purely observational progress. Now the argument why these are so dim that we cannot observe them could be because the dark matter, rather than being particles, are compact objects which are throwing stars out. All of these objects have at most a thousand stars. Their mass to light ratios is of the order of 300 to 1,000. So there's many more uh, black holes out there than stars in those two of phenomena. Some of them, like uh, Eridanus, has a stellar cluster close to the center, which would have been puffed up and be unstable unless there's a black hole at the center, exactly how the scenario proposes. So there is beginning to be a phenomena or observations which seem to agree with, with this uh, with this scenario. Sorry. Wouldn't, yes. Wouldn't all those black holes, the primordial ones, just cluster very quickly and form a central one? It actually, it, it takes quite a while for the merger because they're static. They're, they're not moving much, right? And they're moving in, in those in those clusters. They find each other. Okay. There are thousands of those. Problems. They emit gravitational waves. They do emit gravitational waves, and they they merge to form more massive black holes, but it takes ages. Only the small ones which are close together will uh, merge in the age of the universe. There's nothing to prevent those black holes to still be orbiting, except for the emission of gravitational waves. And we know how quickly the, these uh, binary systems emit gravitational waves. And not so efficient. The emission of gravitational waves is pretty slow. Okay. So, let me finish, because I really have gone over there are other instances like the diffuse gamma ray background, I won't go into that. Or something extremely interesting that Kaczynski realized that there is a cross correlation between 
And this has to do with the reaccession. If you want, at the end, somebody's interested, I may go for this. But of course, the, the big thing is to detect them with a LIGO. So there's a chance we can compute in our scenario what are, what's the total rate, how many events per year per gigaparsec cube we should expect, depending on the mean mass, this would be 30 solar masses, and the width of the distribution. And we see that it's perfectly possible to produce such a thing. Moreover, it has a stochastic background that can be measured with, maybe not with advanced LIGO, but simply with LISA, which has an amplitude of 10 to the minus 9, with its frequency range and its mass, which will be detected. OK, so um, I think I'll finish here. I'm going to holes are all over the place in the range of frequencies that will be provided, not just terrestrial experiments like LIGO, but it certainly puts a time in the race. Whereas he has something to say. And I'll leave it with this transparency. This is about the prediction of all. That's the kind of spectrum that we expect to have from primordial black holes. Being merging early in the early universe, say a range of 200, and even nowadays, yeah, those that are in these frequencies will be merging. Right, so I'll finish here. Let me uh, recapitulate very briefly. So, Going back to the figure that I was showing in the first lecture, maybe we could put this up and we're going to use it. symmetry of the universe, this is much higher, higher symmetry of the universe. It could explain, perhaps, the formation of primordial magnetic fields, which is uninteresting. It could also produce, by the way, gravitational waves, not just the gravitational waves that will be produced by primordial black holes when they merge, but the gravitational waves, which will give us a snapshot of what was the universe like at the time of the Big Bang. This is the Big Bang of our, of our model. But finally, if some feature occurs in the uh, fundamental theory of inflation, it's still under, uh, under discussion, uh, these features in the, in the power spectrum produced from some dynamics during inflation might give rise to primordial black holes when they re-enter the horizon and themselves evolve, become the dark matter, and form structure. Now, if they are responsible for the dark matter, and somebody asked me, you know, I will describe also, it might be also a response for some features in the relaxation epoch, which in principle should be uh, probed by the, the future uh, square kilometer array. So, as you can see from, from this picture, there is, for the first time, the possibility of looking at many different angles to the problem of cosmology 
and making correlations among those different angles and trying to extract from fundamental physics what is the actual effect of those uh, perturbations in the present universe. Unfortunately, we live in an era where we want precision cosmology to answer those fundamental questions, but at the same time, we have to deal with two things, systematics of observations and astrophysics. Astrophysics can be extremely complicated, messy, and it will get in our way to extract from observations the fundamental principles. But if there are things that help us, like Primordia by Holst to explain the dark matter, which will then tie up to what occurred during inflation, say, 20 years before the end, this will open new avenues, new windows into new windows. Okay? So I leave you with a complicated picture which has correlations that will allow us to infer what was fundamental in the early universe. And this is finished. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. Uh, there was a small point I think I missed. I was wondering why you can get primordial black holes for early on and a very slow mass mm -hmm. and overcome it or not be prohibited by the Chandra's economy. Okay. When you collapse here, yeah. in order to collapse, the only thing you need is gradients which are much bigger than pressure. In the case of the Chandrasekhar second limit, there is a, also the a degeneracy of, um, of electrons. electrons and the degeneracy of neutrons. Uh, but most of these particles uh, at the time are just simply photons. So the exclusion so doesn't apply. This, uh, that's right. The exclusion right. does not apply here. Right. In the case of a star, we know what it is made of. You know, it's not a plasma made of photons. It's a very tiny thing of, of variants out there. Mm -hmm. It's mostly. Uh, relativistic particles which themselves produce photons themselves uh, would, would collapse to form uh, this black hole. So actually the black hole's interior is full of radiation. It's not a matter of matter, it's not a matter of protons or neutrons. It's simply radiation which has collapsed to form the black hole. And therefore this could have a solar mass. Or solar mass. And if you could measure the charge it would be very low. Excuse me? You could find a way of measuring the charge. It'd be very the charge of this black hole? It'd be really low. It's a neutral. neutral. It's okay. a neutral black hole, of course. The, the, the plasma is neutral. It's mm. mostly mm -hmm. mm -hmm. photons. It's a few electrons and protons. You said something about some black holes that form that are too big and they evaporate away very quickly. No, no they're not too big, they're too small. It's too small. Mm -hmm. Only those that are very small evaporate quickly. They have uh, to be below. You remember, it goes like the, the mass of the cube, so you have to be below 10 to the 15 grams, you know, to evaporate within the age of the universe. Right. Okay. So there are certain, in, in gravity, this is like the coalescence of, of two black holes, things take ages, okay, because it's extremely weak interaction, okay. Not only does it take ages for the energy of this binary system to lose and attract those things together, it will take much more than the age of the universe of uh, separate black holes to get together to finally plunge in, like Lago has observed, much more than the age of the universe. So it's very difficult to find through astrophysics uh, instances where these black holes of 30 would have found each other. It's extremely difficult. There are a few models, but they're highly tuned. This is much more economical, much simpler, by far. More questions? If not, I'll make a question on my own. Yes. So the those black holes are made out of photons and the spherical black holes are made out of baryons. Yes. Can you distinguish them by measuring the baryonic number? No. The baryonic number, I would imagine, would have been shed away when those black holes were formed because black holes do not have baryon pair. Yes. The global numbers. They would have been shed away. How? How do you shed away baryon? The baryonic number. number. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's only the end state. He's asking the intermediate state. The end state, we know it cannot have hair, barren hair. And therefore, somehow it has to shave it away. Yes, the question of the host is how. What happens in, in the intermediate evolution that shades away the barrier? Uh, of the collapse? Any other question?
It's not conserves. So why would you need to? Well, no, it's growth numbers. I mean, it's it's growth. Now, what is it? It's conserves. Actually, we're we're in the vacuum. It's so it's different with respect to the baryogenesis. Here, we are in our vacuum at zero temperature, and it's perfect. That's it. Then that heat, which is equal to minus one hundred fifty-seven. It's actually four pi over alpha week. You want the exact number? So this is zero. No chance. There's no baryon fluctuations today in the universe. Okay, the, the question that I was going to make myself, which I didn't have time to discuss, will be done very briefly, is do we have some other means of detecting these black holes in the early universe apart from the realization of the universe? And surprisingly, there is, and I was not aware of it. Uh, after we argued that LIGO had seen the primordial black holes that we proposed, there was this paper by Alexander Kaczynski, who showed that if you look at a certain patch of the, the universe, which is actually not very small, it's rather large, and you look for fluctuations in the cosmic infrared background, infrared background on frequencies of the order of the microns, and you look at the fluctuations in the soft X-ray background, those two backgrounds are completely uncorrelated. The, the cosmic infrared typically comes from dust and from stellar evolution. The soft X-ray background most could come from compact sources like AGNs, etc. So why would these two be correlated over huge distances? And the correlation was one, not just 10 or, or 50, one. Fluctuations in the uh, cosmic infrared background and fluctuations in the soft X-ray matched one to one. I'll show you one of the images here. Okay? How could it be? And he argued the following, which I thought was very ingenious. And that is, the cosmic infrared background will have a component that not only comes from dust, it will come from the early universe, say a range of 20, when those infrared photons today were actually in the past, it had been registered since, in the past there would be UV photons. And the soft X-ray photon would be hard X-ray photons. And he asked himself, what kind of potential well can be sufficiently deep that it would generate such a UV and a high X-ray background? And the only thing that he could come up with was a black hole. And the reason is very simple. Typically, when you have gas, it occupies a certain distance, right? So your potential well is dominated by the gas. You're not never probing sufficiently deep so that you could extract energy. So if this is your, your star, right? typically when you have a particle and this is your passage, so this is your gravitational potential. Okay? You can lose energy gain energy by following the potential well and acquiring it through gravitational conversion into kinetic energy. Now, if you have a black hole, then you go all the way down. And the amount of energy that you can convert is much bigger. If this is gas from the star, then before you can gain su sufficient energy, you've gone into the surface of the of the object of the black of the sorry of the star. Now if you have black holes in the early universe, a wretched uh, 20 or so, then you can convert it. That and you can have particles falling into those and then being rejected, being injected back into the into the universe, producing this infrared and extra background simultaneously. So he argues we need a population of primordial black holes before stars form in order to be there enough of them to produce the fluctuations we observe. This was out of the blue. Okay, he didn't know about our proposal of primordial black holes for seeding galaxies, but it's perfectly in agreement with our scenario. So the infrared photons were there, and they were accelerated into a given... No, 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 it's not the infrared photons. The UV photons were produced from charges that fell into those potential wells of the black holes, and they created a spectrum of UV photons. These are the photons that would realize the universe. Excuse me? That are infrared now. Those are infrared now. Not only would you produce UV, you would also produce X-rays. The usual conversion just breaks down. You have a, a particle which accelerates in the in the potential well and then produces a, a very energetic photon. So hitting gas which is around the black hole would produce a whole array of photons in the UV and in the hard X-ray, which have been today redshifted until when you correlate those two fluctuations, you see that they match. 
When I say fluctuation is crucial, but it's, it's not a uniform diffuse background, it has to have fluctuation because this black hole will be here, the next one will be far away. Those two black holes, in different, uh, they're creating fluctuations in the background. This is the origin of fluctuation, not the diffuse, the overall diffuse one. Okay, the fluctuations in the background are correlated because the gamma rays and the UVs are produced the same, by the same mechanism. That's the argument that he places for putting the source at redshift 20 and being sufficiently compact to uh, generate those photons. Is it generous between how far back in redshift you go and how deep the wells are? The fact that you have infrared today mm -hmm. and uh, you know the range of, of photons, of energy of the photons that you can extract from such a mechanism, mm -hmm. it's a finite range. Okay? So he asks himself, how far should I have to redshift or blue shift actually? from what I observed in the in infrared and in the soft X-ray, so that in the past would fall into the window of energy extraction of uh, primary black holes. And he finds that it has to be rich of 20 or so. Okay. That's how he argues. But rich of 20 is precisely the time you would expect realization to occur within this scenario, very early, rather than rich of 6. So the picture is the following. You have these black holes acquiring mass through mergers, attracting gas, this gas feeding into those black holes, and growing in mass until they start reionizing the universe. So they're, they're gaining gas, the gas ignites, goes through thermonuclear reactions, they reionize the universe, they form bubbles, and this occurs at relatively high redshift. This occurs in very few places. That's why the reionization is not going to be a uniform a process. It's going to be isolated sources of reinsertion. That's something to tell us AA. Look for sources, they, uh, not for uniform distribution of sources of reinsertion, but localized sources of reinsertion, like Kaczynski finds. And then search how quickly would the reinsertion of the universe occur. And I claim that this will occur very, very slowly. It's a gravitational phenomenon. Masses gain very slowly, both by accretion and motivation. And as it grows slowly, eventually you realize the universe completely. So you will have a different picture of realization until today if you do it this way or if you make a transition. So the universe was realized around redshift 6. We see this because there are string time climate alpha systems already observed. But whether it occurred this way or this way, is still uncertain. This is what SKA and other things will try to do. So the thing that we can measure today at redshift zero, this is redshift, say 20 or so, the thing that we can measure from the CMB, for instance, is the optical depth. That is the integral of the opacity from redshift 1100 until today. Okay? It's just a simple quantity. It's a full integral. Now, if this is the transition of this one, you don't know. And that's the thing which SKA will be able to tell apart. If things were very slowly growing towards realization at redshift 20 and finished at redshift 6, and this occurred in, in localized sources, then you're advocating the model of primary black holes as sources of their realization of years. If it would, is through gravitational collapse or very rare peaks in the Gaussian random field, then you expect this to be very uniform. So the patchiness of realization is a quantity that one can characterize in this scenario and will be different from the standard lambda product virus scenario. And this is something which this group here in uh, South Africa should be able to address. Okay. Having the possibility of exploring in 21 centimeters with square kilometer rate the epoch of realization. That's why I left it to the end. Any other questions? Uh, I've got a collateral comment on things related to the thing Cosmos said. Uh, yeah, few or well, around 20 or 25 measurements of neutron stars with masses higher than 1.5. Yeah, there is. So, so it's not that difficult apparently to, to, to find these kind of stars. That, of course, may come from two different sources at least. 
One is that the question of state people are using a lot of not fully correct, and there are attempts in that line of reasoning. Uh, that will change you. You only need to change the QCD interaction by orders of magnitude like 3, 4, let's say mm -hmm. 3 to 4 in some parameters in your QCD. But the other alternative, which could be complementary, is to modify gravity for sure. And actually, what uh, several people did, but we did in particular, was to prove that it's not difficult at all. For instance, with the kind of Stavinsky model, which is negligible nowadays, right, in cosmological scales, but could be, I think this is what was meant, that in high curvatures may reappear, like okay. it reappears in inflation, right? Mm -hmm. It's not difficult to generate easily uh, heavy stars, which are still stars, which are stable, which satisfy the TOV equation. Mm -hmm. And then they, those stars can merge and provide, well, black holes, but in any case, they could be able to to give enough energy, both in scalar and tensor models, but particularly in tensor models, this is something that we can do yet, but mm -hmm. would be nice. So the merging of neutral stars would be uh, provided, would be able to provide the light, the, the light signal. But of course, for that you need uh, proper numerical simulation of modified gravity phenomena. So this is each 60 solar masses or 30 solar masses? Yeah, easy. Easy? Easy. I mean, easy in the sense that what you measure from a very high distance mm -hmm. is both the, let's say, I'm going to say the classical mass plus the scalar mode. So that scalar mode is adding density into the density unit. That's a very long distance. What about short distances, like a solar radii? Or, or no, but this is what I mean. That the, for those mass radius uh, diagrams, what you take is the asymptotic mass, let's say. Yeah, so the merging you? Yeah, okay. the merging is something, of course, we have to do. But, but if you doing the baryonic conservation number yeah. in the merging, not in the cosmological mm -hmm. uh, arena, then you can see that it's not, uh, in, that you can actually do it. Merging two neutron stars, conserving the baryonic number, and releasing energy both in tensor and in scale. Okay, I'm not saying that everything is tensor. Okay, that's important. Uh, you've got enough energy that may some of it go into the, into the light signal and some of it be scalar. But that's only I think doing anything right now. I'm going to present the scalar signals of these kind of stars. For the merging, we need to do it, right? Because the GR simulations are available. But we don't know how those peaks went. That's, true. But that's a very good mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to blah 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 blah, but in, in Vino Veritas, so uh, that's for for the <laughs> okay. uh, after well, after during. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you once again for the course. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> for the record. Just like any other uh, global U1, uh, you will not produce any hair for black holes. There's no reason why the global U1 that uh, we draw here would be any different from any other U1. I mean, no, the global U1s do not leave any hair. Okay, so maybe instead of hair, the barrier would it carry the charge? Would it be one of the other? Probably the, the moment you produce, I haven't talked about black holes here, but the moment you produce those black holes, the, the H field will be shed away. In the, in the collapse to form the black hole. But that's beyond what I have described so far. You have another question? Somebody else has another question? <coughs> yes. Yes, when you completed the, um, the decay rate for the inflaton, then for those ones, you went on the end? Yeah. Okay. Why is that? No. The, the thing which, for, for bosons, you get the mass of the of the boson squared, but the mass is goes like GV. Okay, so you have V, which is the coupling. The mass of the final part of the final part. That's right. Well, M is what of is the mass of the field of the case. Yeah, this is quite generic. 
Okay, let's go on. Yeah. 